A welcome back to another episode of SolidWorks Live Design, episode 19. Uh, today, we are going to be going back and taking a look at a previous design and figuring out how to do packaging for it. So I'm going to go ahead, let's go ahead and take a look at the model we're going to be referencing. If you've been following SolidWorks Live Design, you know that uh, Andrew Barnes, back in episode three, did an amazing surfacing episode where he modeled this wax iron. This is for putting wax on the bottom of a snowboard. So really cool product. Um, and I was thinking, what could we do for live design? And every great product needs good packaging. So I'm gonna come back over here. I was kind of like going through some packaging I had around my house. So my latest mouse I bought. So I'm a bit of a gamer. I have this uh, Proteus Spectrum Logitech mouse and you pull it out and it's just kind of a clamshell. Sorry, this camera in this mode is really close. So we basically got this blister pack and a piece of plastic that's gonna hold it right here. This is simple. This is, you don't really get to touch or feel this until you take it out of the box. Uh, another product I was looking at is, this is a gaming uh, uh, speed pad I use. I like that this one, you can open it up and, sorry about the lighting there, I need better lighting in here. You can open it up and you can see the product, but this is sealed in the store. So like, I really like how you can open this up, but the issue with this one is, is that, uh, um, you can't open it in the store. It's taped shut. So I was like, these are all right. And then I kind of looked at some other ones. I have an older set of Beats headphones. They, this is kind of like a book, how this one opens. But then I remembered, I had this mouse that I bought uh, a while back and it had some really cool packaging in it. Uh, one of the things I really liked, I'm gonna switch my view over here so you can see what I'm referring to. It was a Logitech mouse, uh, it was a G700S. So the mouse itself was kind of stored in this guy. When you open the package up in the store, you could flip it open and you could see the product inside of it and you could kind of get an idea of what this felt like uh, and kind of what the contour of it looked like. So I really liked this concept of packaging, of presenting the product to the, end, the consumer while they were in the store. So that's what I want to try to tackle today is something like this. I don't own this mouse anymore, so I can't, uh, I can't do that one. Um, so this is what it looked like when you pulled it out. So you had an internal structure piece and then you had a, uh, and then you had an external box that kind of went around it. So today what I thought we would do, let's see, I got one more picture of it. So this is what it looked like. You had the box. And then you had kind of this internal piece that held it all together inside. So we're gonna create something like this, but we're going to do it for, I need to hide this. We're going to do it for Andy's uh, wax iron. So, and again, welcome everybody in the chat. We have lots of people from India, Pakistan, Italy. Uh, great to have all of you here. Uh, so yeah, keep those questions coming in as we're going here. So. We're going to create that packaging for this product. So this is gonna be a little bit more of an advanced topic. We're going to be doing some surfacing, some mixed modeling, where we're going to be modeling with solids and surfaces together as we go through here. And then we're going to create some of this. I'm going to refer to this as cardboard, but I get it, this isn't really cardboard. It's like card stock. It's like a thicker paper as we go through there. Uh, keep in mind, I'm not a uh, packaging professional, uh, so I, I may make mistakes as I go through here. So let's start with this. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to work inside of an assembly. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to bring this component into an assembly. And I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna do this the easiest way I know how. I'm gonna go up here to the top corner and I'm gonna say, make an assembly from this parter assembly and I'm gonna pick one of my templates and then I'm just gonna hit okay. Now, when you insert this into the assembly, one of the things that happens is that component gets fixed to the origin in its default orientation. The problem is, is I, wanted to, I like to design this box in the correct orientation. So if I go to a front view, this actually is what I would call a side view of the part. So we're going to reorient this. I'm gonna un, 
uh, fix this component by right clicking and going to float. So right away, we're starting with some assembly stuff here. And I'm gonna rotate this part. Now, if you remember from the image that I had up on here, this thing kind of sits at a bit of an angle inside of this, that's the wrong picture. Inside of this box, this thing kind of sits at an angle. And that's what I want. I want when you open this box in the store to present the product to the user. So I want to kind of get this into an orientation that looks like that. So what I'm going to go ahead and do is I'm going to start by mating. I want to fix this into location correctly. So I'm going to mate this to its right plane here. And then let's go over to our right view. So right now, this thing is kind of free to move around. The next thing I want to do is I want to locate this somewhere in space. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the origin of that component and the origin of this and of my assembly, and I want to mate those together. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to click the actual mate paper clip, but paper clip button. And you'll notice that if I've already got something defined, if you've ever tried this mating an origin to an origin by default, it'll try to align the axes of those two parts. If you use it from the paperclip menu, it won't do that. So that'll save you kind of a step of having to come in here and uncheck that. So now when I look at this, this thing's just free to move. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of get it at an angle that I feel like I'll want to look at it in the box and then I'm going to take its top plane in the top plane here and we're going to just put an angle on here. 24.6, let's make that 25. Let's make it a real number. So we have this part located in position. Um, what I want to do now is we're going to start on the blister. Probably the hardest part of this design is going to be getting that plastic blister this piece right here, so this piece of plastic, granite, it's gonna look different. It's gonna have the shape and then it's gonna just come out. Um, so let's insert a new component. So I'm gonna go here and I'm gonna insert a new part. And you'll notice when you, I do this, it creates what's called the virtual part. It actually didn't ask me to save this anywhere. I love virtual parts for this reason. When I'm concepting and just thinking of an idea, virtual parts are great for quickly throwing a component into a design. And if I don't like it, I can delete it. And there's no file on disk. Uh, when I'm ready to save this file, I can right click on it and save it to an external file if I want to. But from a concepting standpoint, I'm going to use, I'm going to just use a virtual part and I'm going to rename it and we're going to call it the blister. You could call this the clamshell, though I'm not going to clamshell this design. I am going to put it in a, in a box <clears throat> when it's done with this. I'm also going to float this component and I'm going to do some orientation. Now, this may, may be a little advanced if you haven't run into this before, but one of the things I always want to do when I'm mating my components into space is I want to think about their orientation. And now I'm doing that with a component that has no geometry inside of it. So hopefully this makes sense. I'll revisit why I'm doing what I'm about to do when we get to probably a more visual. Actually, you know what? No, yeah, we'll, we'll just make this this way right now. I know that I want the top plane of that blister to be parallel with this component. So I'm going to take the top plane from our blister and I'm going to expand the wax iron in its top plane and I'm going to make those coincident to one another. I know that this component can move back and forth in space, so I'm also going to make its right plane coincident with the right plane in our assembly. And then I'm going to take our origins and just like I did before, I'm going to mate those together like so to fully define it. So you'll see why what I just did right there will kind of have a, have a bigger impact when I do this first step. So I've got these two components, they're located. Let's get to actually designing the blister. Right inside of the assembly, I'm going to choose to edit this component. We're going to be doing a lot of in-context modeling here. Now I know that that can be a scary concept for some people like creating relationships to other pieces of geometry. But the reality is when I'm working with something like this, this is really, I have to create these in context relationships here. So I want to basically copy all the surfaces of this part into this new blister component. So I have my surfaces toolbar up here, but I don't really like going up to the command manager. So what I'm going to do really quickly is I'm going to take my shortcut bar or the S key and I'm going to right click and choose to customize it. And what I'm going to do, 
oops, let's do that again. Right click, customize. I want to add my surfacing tools to this, not one at a time. One of the things uh, a couple episodes ago, I went through some customization options in the user interface. I don't know if I covered this, but we have what are called the flyout toolbars and I can grab my surfacing tools and we're going to be using some weldment tools a little bit later on. So let's add those as well. I'll resize these. I actually don't want these on my assembly toolbar. Um, let's do this really quick. I'm going to open this part up and we'll customize it here. Customize. We'll do that same thing I just did. I'm going to add my surfacing tools and my weldment tools to my part tool, my part shortcut toolbar. And let's go back here and edit that again. So now though my all my weldment tools and my surfacing tools are available here. Notice it doesn't show any of the commands that are grayed out when I do that. So what I want to do is I want to copy these surfaces. Now there are two ways to do this and I'm going to talk about the two ways in pros and cons of one. If I just want to copy the surfaces, we can use knit surface. In knit, most people think of it as a command that you can use to actually merge surfaces together, but you can actually use knit in context. You can see here <coughs> that I've actually copied those surfaces over into that part. But there's some challenges with this. Uh, when we're dealing with a part like this, one of the things we may want to do is we may want to offset that or change that value. So I'm going to actually preference using offset surface here. I am going to use an offset of zero. Hold on, I need a drink a minute. <clears throat> and the reason I'm going to I'm going to leave this zero and we're going to talk about putting clearance around this product a little bit later in the design because I want to show some other really cool features. Other re the other reason for this is, <coughs> ah, sorry, my throat is very scratchy right now all of a sudden. The other reason for this, <coughs> oh boy, the other reason for this is uh, I like to work with the native geometry as much as possible. By offsetting it, we're putting some of that offset in there. This geometry was created inside of SolidWorks, but it, this could be imported geometry, in which case um, it can change and do things you might not know. So we're going to do an offset of zero, and I'm basically going to copy all the surfaces I think I'm going to want the clamshell to touch. And I say I think. So I'm going to... I've. I'm going to go through this process and I'm going to grab as much as I want. We're going to deal with <coughs> this grommet a little bit differently later on. Um, so I'm going to exclude those for right now. So I'm going to copy those surfaces in here and let's go take a look at what we have. So I'm going to open this up. First thing I want to look at is do I really need all of this right here? I don't need this extra material. So let's go ahead and let's start by trimming some of that away. So there's all my surfacing tools. Remember how I added the flyout toolbar right there? I can go in here. I'm going to grab the trim command and we're going to remove that extra material right there. Um, there's some geometry right here that I'm probably going to want to deal with later. We'll look at that a little bit later how we may close that up. So. So the first thing I want to do is uh, I, I, I know that this is probably going to be vacuum formed. Uh, so I know I need to have some draft on this part. And so that's why I didn't go under that handle. I don't want this just to wrap around this part. It has to be able to lay over top of it. So, you know, the mouse, the actual mouse I'm using here, you can see it obviously needs to be able to pull out of this. So in this case, a wax iron. So let's, that's why I left this hole in the middle. So let's start by trying to fill this in. And I'm going to do this one of the easiest ways I know. I'm going to try using the fill surface command right here. I'm going to right click and I'm going to, I want to select all these edges. So I think Andrew covered this in his section, but there's a really useful command here called select open loop where it'll find all the open edges and select them all in a row. When I was kind of walking through this, I showed Andrew a trick. I'm going to share it here because he said it was super useful. Didn't, uh, didn't realize you could do that. Sometimes you don't want to select everything. Maybe I want to just select this line, this line, this line. See, look at this. This is why these selection tools are useful. This one, this one. Look at all these little segments right here. 
there's a trick where you can select near the endpoint here and you can select near the endpoint here and right click and there's an option called select partial loop. And notice what it'll do. It didn't select all the open loops. It selected from the end of that line, from the end of this line over to this line. So select partial loop is really useful when working with surfaces and you don't want to select all the open loop edges and you don't want to pick them individually. This is a great way to go through and just grab a subset of edges. I do want all the edges in this case. So I'm going to right click and say select open loop fill surface. And let's take a look at what we have. Well, the zebra stripes look pretty good coming off of that part. I don't, I have one weird twist right here. So let's try, let's make these all tangent to one another. So I'm not as worried about the aesthetics. Yeah, look at that. KCB partial loop. That's a game changer. <laughs> Uh, so when I know a SolidWorks employee goes, wow, I didn't know you could do that. I figured that would be a useful one here. So, so I'm going to go ahead and add this and I'm going to choose to knit this geometry. I'm going to merge this with the rest of the surfaces and press OK. I have some concerns though. That looks like it comes in quite a bit. So what are we going to do? We're going to go up to our evaluate tools and take a quick look at draft analysis and I'm gonna select my top plane. So now all of a sudden, hopefully it's becoming obvious why it was important for me to orient this with the part uh, at the assembly level. I knew that my draft direction had to correlate to how these two components were going to pull apart. That's why I wanted it, no matter what orientation it was in, I wanted that clamshell or that blister to always be aligned. So we can see here with three degrees of draft, which is about generous, I think, for a vacuum form right here, this is going to be a problem. We actually have a negative draft. So we have to figure out how we're going to fix this. I'm gonna delete this surface fill. So there's a couple reasons that's happening. It's happening, one, because this surface down here is so extreme and it's pushing this face inward. And then the top of the handle kind of wraps around a bit and it's pushing it down below the handle there. So what we're going to do is we're going to trim some of this material away. And we're going to take a look at a couple different ways to do this. So I actually have a little bit of extra geometry here that I don't need. I actually don't think I'm going to use these two faces here. So I could go remove those from this surface offset, but I'll take care of those a different way here in a minute. Let's start with this bottom, how it's kind of curving in. Let's smooth this out a little bit. I kind of want to look at this arc here going around this part. So let's start a sketch on the top plane. And what I'm going to go ahead and do here is I'm going to just draw some geometry to kind of trim this away. So right there, I'm going to, because I'm more mechanically inclined, I'm going to fully define this stuff just because I like to have dimensions on the screen. A lot of this stuff is kind of visual and you may find yourselves uh, not doing this. And then I'm going to dimension to the outside of this arc. I don't know if everybody knows this, but if you hold the shift key while dimensioning to an arc, instead of selecting the center point, it will actually select the, uh, the tangency. So see how I did that? I held shift while I clicked that. And now I can dimension to the outside of that arc right there. And now I have a nice fully defined sketch. <clears throat> the first thing that I look at when I do this is I go, you know what? I'm going to use the trim surface command with this sketch and I want to trim this. And we get an error. It says, cannot partition surface. The trim tool and target do not intersect. What it's actually say, telling me here is this curve does not fully intersect of this model, so I can't trim with it. Well, all I'm trying to trim are these two faces. Well, a trick we can use here is instead of trying to just trim right away, we can come in here and we can use a split line. And we can take a sketch and project it onto our surfaces here and right click and look at that. Well, now that we've done that, we've got a separate face, we can go ahead and we can actually just right click and delete those faces and they're gone. So, so instead, so sometimes if while you're working in surfaces, the trim command doesn't work, try splitting a face and then using delete, delete face on that. That's another way you can kind of get around that without having to create, without having to trim geometry you don't want to. 
So this looks better. Let's take a look at what we have. Let's go to select open loop. Let's go to our surfaces command and do a filled surface. And that looks a little bit better right there. Let's try it with tangency. I don't like the way it was coming out down there. I think we're still going to have an issue up here. So when I come in here, let's take a look. Let's go to evaluate. Let's go to draft analysis. Let's grab our top plane. We still have an issue here with our draft. Okay, so let's, let's undo that. Let's look at how we can pull this surface back. How can we bring a surface back to a specific amount of draft? I'm going to take a look at that um, uh, split line command again. And there is a really cool capability in here. Um, Eric, welcome to the stream. Always great to have you here. Uh, we're going to go into the split line command and instead of using projection, we're going to use an option called silhouette. Silhouette split line is really useful when you have say a curved surface that crosses, uh, you wanna capture where like that surface crosses a specific uh, threshold or a plane or something like that. So for example, if I was looking straight down at the part, and I wanted the zero degrees of draft. Well, we can actually come in here and we can specify a pole direction and an amount of draft we, do we want to accommodate for. And then what we do is we select the surfaces we wanna cut with this. So what this is going to do is it's going to say, it's going to find the silhouette of these surfaces as a 10 degree draft were cut on it. So take a, take a look at this. This is extremely useful how this cut this surface. It found a split here, a split here, a split. It found all these, but look at these ones. These are the ones I'm most interested in right here. These are where that curve are really coming across that threshold that's preventing us from getting that draft. Now, I can tell you if I delete this face right here, I'm going to have a problem with fill surface. It's just not going to go very well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to edit that split line. Let's just split this here. And now what I want to do is I want to create a blend from this line down to this line right here. I actually want it to go to where that surface used to be right there. See that guy right there where that surface, let's actually do this. Let's suppress this. I'm going to roll this back just a little bit here. I want a curve that kind of comes from here down to about here. So what we're going to do is we're going to um, we're going to create a sketch on our right plane, and we're going to make a uh, we're going to make a nice curve so that that blends in well with what we have left after that delete face. So we're going to do this using uh, splines. Now you could do this using a normal spline, but everybody seems to be a big fan of the style spline. They're really easy, simple to use. So I'm going to do this with a spot, a style spline. And basically I want to create a spline from here to here. Now I'm going to show you, a, oops, I hit escape before I should have. Let's go from here to here. Okay. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to make this spline. I did a normal spline. I am all over the place today. Let's go style spline. Here we go. Here to here. And what I want is I want this line to come off of here. Tangency. We could use curvature continuity. This is a clamshell. I'm not as worried about the packaging. And I'm going to show you a trick here. One of the things I did with the style spline. I only created one uh, vertice with a style spline. And this is going to create a challenge. This line is tangent to this. I actually can't make this line tangent to this while preserving this one. So what happens is, is when I go and I grab this line in this spline and I try to make those tangent, watch what happens to my style spline. Boom, it actually added another point, but unfortunately it didn't add the relationship. So I'm going to do that again. So kind of a tip there, if you ever see something not acting the way you expect, um, take a look. It may have been trying to do something for you there. So now all I want to do is I kind of want to flesh this out, make sure that that's going to look good, and let's do one on the other side. So now that I know style spline is going to require two points, let's go ahead and just add those right away. Let's add our tangency. Um, yeah, let's add our tangency right here. And let's add our tangency right here. 
And that one looks pretty good. I'm happy with how that one looks. So I'm not dimensioning these ones. I just want these to look right to kind of facilitate a blend here. And we're going to use, let's go into our surfacing tools. We're going to use split line again. And we're going to split these faces with that sketch. Okay, I'm going to move that up before this delete face. And then now when we unsuppress this, well, I need to delete those faces. Let's just edit the one I did here. Let's also delete this face, this face, and this face. Boom. Okay, so now let's see what we've got here. Same thing we did before. Right click. You know what? Let's just edit this one right here. We've got one in here. Let's right click. Uh, select the open loop. And so I don't like this right here. See, I don't want that coming straight up out of that surface. So I'm thinking, I like this here though. Let's just try doing tangency to the whole thing. Mm, that looks pretty good. And let's merge that with the rest of the solid. So what are we gonna do next? We are going to check our draft analysis. So. Pull direction is top plane. Look at that. We Because we pulled it back 10 degrees with that silhouette line, it looks like we've got plenty to work with right here. Looks like about the worst it gets down here, 6 degrees, 4 degrees, 4.9. So we could pump bump this up. Looks like we have a spot here where it's just over 3 degrees. So, But 3 degrees is what we're looking for, so looks pretty good there. Let's take a look at how this looks in the assembly. Well, yeah, let's go back to the assembly. So looks like it's hugging the surface, but we have a problem here. So because I trimmed that surface back, this part is kind of bulging out a little bit. So I'm going to go look at how we may fix that. Let's edit this feature. So I'm worried that the tangency is causing this to wrap in too quickly right here. So I'm going to find that edge right there. I want to change this one. Let's see what happens if we change this to contact. Kind of force that to come straight out of there a little bit more. That looks a little bit better. Let's see how it looks on the model. That looks pretty good right there. Looks like we may want to change this one over here to a contact as well. So we'll do that really quick. Let's open this back up. Let's edit that surface. And we want to just find there was looks like there was another edge right here. We may want to switch to a contact as well. So we'll call that good for right now. All right, next thing we want to do, we want to basically mirror this over to the other side. So I wanted to talk about this cutout right here. I'm getting to the point where I kind of want to seal this off. There's really two ways you can handle this cutout. And I want to show this command, even though I'm not going to use it. And I, I'm doing kind of a lot of things as I go through here. I want to look at how do you deal with some of these cutouts that are part of a surface? Well, the untrim command is a great tool to select a surface like this. And what it'll do is it'll evaluate all the surfaces that are connected to that edge and it will try to just refill in what it thinks that surface should be. So untrim is a really, really good tool to use right here. I'm going to show you another way we could get rid of this hole though. I'm going to mirror this body. So I know that the part is symmetric, so I'm very confident we can take this, mirror the body. Keep in mind, there's a checkbox here when you're working with surfaces. You want to knit these together. So we have this hole in here. And I could come in here and I could go a uh, filled surface. I could do a planar surface. I could do an untrimmed surface. Or I could select the edge and just press my delete key and say delete the hole. And it'll add a deleted hole here. And you can actually see, because I can create a sketch on that, that's a perfectly planar surface that I could work with and create sketches on right there. Delete hole is really nice. It doesn't leave any edges or anything like that on there. As opposed to if I came in here with fill surface and I did a contact and I press OK, well, first of all, we'd have to knit it together, right? We merge the results. Uh, that one gave me a nice flat surface too. Sometimes you'll find though, like you get like a split line on there. So delete holes, easy. Press the delete key on a hole. And it basically, it's doing an untrim to all of that geometry right there. All right. 
So I like where we're at with this. Um, let's add some color to this. Let's go into our plastic. Let's grab a clear plastic. I'm going to make it polycarbonate. There we go. Kind of get it to look good. I'm going to press save. The next, what's the next part of this? Oh boy, we're at 130 already. I need to uh, capture this cord whip here. So I've done all this with surfacing. The cord whip, I actually feel like I can get away with a little bit more. I'm gonna just use some traditional SolidWorks features. Uh, some solid, I'm gonna do some solid modeling. I'm going to grab the right plane from inside my part. I always try to reference the part geometry as opposed to assembly geometry when I can. I find that that gives me less opportunities for problems later. Like maybe I delete this blister from this assembly and then it, it can't find that reference anymore. So it's one of the reasons I would do this. What I want to do, is, but anyway, what I want to do is I kind of want to create a some geometry that comes up around here. It's going to wrap around. And then we're just going to have it in the assembly come straight down. So here I am going to reference an assembly plane in this line. I'm going to make those perpendicular to one another. I want this to be parallel to this cylindrical feature. So I want to find the center axis of this feature. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and go to my view tools and I'm going to turn on temporary axes and it will for any cylindrical feature it'll show those and I'm going to make these two parallel to one another and I'm going to go ahead and throw a dimension on here that looks way bigger than what I need it to be so I kind of want to capture this a little bit I definitely want to capture this so it looks like somewhere between 8 and 10 will work I'm going to just make it 10 and then I want this arc to start where it would intersect the top of this grommet. And now I just need to kind of find the size I want this to be. Let's go ahead and add a radius in here. What's 25 look like? That's a little tight. Let's make that 26. So we'll make that 26. That looks pretty good. So what we're doing right now is we're trying to make everything fit tight around this geometry. We're going to deal with the offsets of all that later. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to draw a line here. I want the top plane in this to be collinear to one another. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a solid. So I have a surface and now I'm going to go back to my traditional SolidWorks features. And what I want to do is I want to encompass basically this geometry. So let's go to a mid-plane extrusion and let's just drag this out. Let's see something that looks pretty good. 20. 20 looks pretty good right there. Let's try 20. Now, 20 looks all right, but we need to have draft on this. So I'm going to go in here and I'm going to put some draft on this from the bottom face. My direction of pull is going to be up. So I'm going to click this arrow to flip that around. And we need to draft this outside face and this outside face here. Now I'm going to do something to make this part a little bit easier to see. Let's go into here and let's turn off the transparency part of that material for a minute getting a little hard to see. All right, let's go back and edit this part again. So once I add the draft, you can see we're going to have an issue with that grommet. So let's go ahead. Let's increase this. Let's I'm going to just do some instant 3D and kind of play around with a number that looks good. Now I like nice whole numbers, so I'm going to just set that at 30. I think I can get away with a fillet around here to cover these up. So I'm not going to get too worried about that. I'm also going to turn those temporary axes on. Let's make this look nice. Let's throw a quick fillet on here. We're going to go from, uh, we could go something like this. That doesn't, eh, that looks okay. Let's try this. Let's do a full round fillet and go from this outside face to this face to this face. So this is going to create, I'm going to go back to my old days of using 2D CAD, a tangent, tangent, tangent arc, if anybody remembers that. So basically this is a fillet that'll stay tangent along this face, this face, and this face. And because I have tangent propagation on, it's going to honor that full radius all the way around. So 
Full round fillet's a great way to just create a nice smooth profile on there. All right, that's looking pretty good. Let's exit out of there. Let's go back into our part and we're gonna need to join these together. I am going to go back to, there we go. That looks a little better. All right, so what do we wanna do? We wanna join this geometry together because I kinda of wanna put a fillet in there. I don't want this white color. I think I used, let's do this. Why does it keep turning white? I don't know. Usually it turns gray. I don't know. It's really white for some reason. Um, I want to put a fillet in here, but I have a surface and a solid. So let's look at how we can join these together. There's two ways I'm going to do this. And the first way is the most obvious. Let's make the surface geometry a solid. So how are we gonna do this? Well, the first thing we need to do is we need to put a surface on the bottom. Now I'm lucky, I know that this geometry is planar. If I select that open loop, I can come up to my surfaces tools and I can create a planar surface using those edges. I can then knit that surface to this surface and we can create a solid body out of that. So now I, instead of surface bodies, I have two solids which I can then right mouse click on and I can do a Boolean operation and combine those together. So I was able to do that in three features pretty quickly. I'm gonna show you another way to do it in one feature. Now, just because I can do it in one feature doesn't always mean it's the best way to do this. There are pros and cons to every way you model something inside of SolidWorks. That's a very stable method, uh, tried and true way of doing things, but I wanna show you a really cool tool inside of SolidWorks. It's called the intersect command. And when I hover over, what does it say? It says intersects surfaces, planes, and solids to create volumes. What the intersect command does is it allows me to select any of that type of geometry. So for example, I can select a, sur a solid body, a surface body, and because I modeled this with good design intent, my top plane is right at the bottom a plane. So I selected a solid, a surface, and a plane. Well, and then what I do is I tell SolidWorks to calculate, can you, what kind of, in, what enclosed regions can you make from this geometry? So intersect them all. And you can see here, it created a filled version of this using the top plane kind of as a, uh, as a bottom surface. And what this tool allows you to do is you can remove sections out of there. Maybe I don't want that middle piece. Maybe I don't want that. Look at that. It kind of did that Boolean operation for me. But in this case, I actually wanted to just make all of that geometry right there. So we could do it two ways there, as you saw. We could do it the kind of that traditional way, and then we could do it with this new intersect feature here. I really wanted to show intersect as I went through here. Uh, we're going to take a look at it again with something else that we're going to do. Going to go ahead and we're going to throw a fillet on here. Let's uh, pick something big enough to... So we want to cover up this material. We need to make sure that this will work. Eight seems to look pretty good. I could probably go a little bigger. Let's go to a nine millimeter radius. And let's press OK. All right, so right now we have a solid geometry. Oh, by the way, when I did the intersect command, see how it left that surface body back there? There is an option I always forget to click when I do intersect. If I don't need those surfaces anymore, I could say consume them. Now notice when I do this, this uh, surface body will go away. So now I don't see it when I roll the part over. All right. So what do we have next? We need to create the flange. Now I'm gonna reference this again. We're not going to come out and over. Remember the packaging we're going to kind of look at is going to be more like this guy right here. So I need just a flat material that comes out of there. So I'm trying to think what's gonna be the best way to do this. So eventually we need to look at the overall material for this as well, so. Let's go ahead, let's create that flange. I'm gonna go on my top plane. I'm going to just simply create a rectangle right here. And I'm gonna create a center line down the middle. And I want that center line to be coincident to my right plane or my origin, doesn't matter. And we're just gonna give uh, some space for this flange to come off from this part. So 15 millimeters here. I want it to be 
at least 50 on the side. But here's the thing. I don't know how wide this part is. Look at this. I want this to be a real number. And it looks like I got lucky. I got 210. So I'm going to go ahead and say leave that driven. But I'm guessing if I actually look at this, I'm going to make that a driving dimension. So if you don't know, you can throw reference dimensions on geometry and then you can right click and make it driving or driven. When I look at that, it's not really 210 millimeters. It's 209.99941. Let's make it 210 so that when we make our square box, the guy cutting out the cardboard doesn't ask why, or the, the, the hardboard doesn't ask why we chose such a weird size on that. Now this piece is going to be at an angle, so I'm not too concerned. I want a dimension from here to this tangency, but because this isn't a true circle, I don't get that option to dimension to that arc. So what we're going to do is we're going to put a point that intersects all this geometry right here and we're going to dimension to that. So there's a little tip. If you ever want to dimension to a point in space, there's actually a way when you're dimensioning also to find the intersection. So when you're in the dimension command, if I go, let's see here. You can do find intersection of that line and another piece of geometry. You could actually do it kind of on the fly right there. All right. So let's go ahead. Let's, uh, sorry, I keep kind of peeking down at chat down there. Uh, so one thing we haven't thought about is how thick is this plastic going to be? I'm going to say that this is going to be about a half a mil, like half a millimeter thick. It's super thin, it's super thin material. So let's just call it a half a millimeter. Let's bring that up. Let's add some fillets. So that merged with that geometry. We're gonna talk about this in just a minute. And we're going to go ahead and we're going to add a fillet. I wanna add a big fillet and I'm zooming way in because I have to grab this little tiny edge right here. And now I gotta do that for four other edges. But there's this thing called the selection manager, selection helper that pops up. And notice when I do this, this first option, I just know from using it, it's going to go find every edge that's the same length in the same orientation on that plane. So when I pick this and I zoom out, I was really confident that it was going to find, I knew there were only four edges on there. Keep in mind, if you had any cutouts, it would have grabbed those external sharp edges as well. So very useful tool once you learn kind of how those selections work. Great for finding that stuff. So, all right, here we go. Uh, let's turn our transparency back on. I'm trying to speed up here a little bit. We need to shell this thing, right? So now we have this clam shell. My first reaction is let's do a half a millimeter material. Let's shell the material out and the world should be good, right? We went the wrong way with the shell, right? So you guys see what happened there? We shelled inward. We actually need to shell outward on this. So let's go ahead. That's an option in shell. You can shell outward. But this is going to create a problem with this flange we made right here. If we zoom in, you can see that it actually took that flange and it offset that a half a millimeter outward as well. So how are we going to handle this? All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to get rid of this shell and we got to do this as two separate options. So I'm going to edit this uh, flange I made here and I'm going to uncheck merge results. Let's not merge. Let's treat these as two separate solid bodies right now. So what I can do is I can do this kind of one of two ways here. So I'm going to tab to hide that solid body. If you didn't know that you can tab to hide bodies and shift tab to bring them back if you know where they are or you can show hide them from over here we're going to shell just this piece of this outward let's grab the bottom and that'll give us our offset there and shift tab to bring that back well guess what we're going to do we're going to use that same intersect tool on these two pieces of geometry now check this out what it's going to do here it found that there were five regions. What The way I actually like to use this tool is this selection says, what do you want to exclude? I'm gonna actually click what I wanna keep. I wanna keep that and that. And I wanna keep this little region where they intersect with one another. Oh, intersect. Ah, now it makes sense. 
here's the problem. If I press OK right now, it's going to keep the inside of that material. And that's actually not what I wanted it to do. So we're going to go back, edit that. And there's a really cool option here because that to me is the easy way to do that. There's an option down here to invert the selection. So now I'm going to get rid of the internals and I'm going to remember this option to consume those surfaces. Give that a minute to think and that looks pretty good. It's looking really good. Here's the challenge though. This surface, if I look right down, right at the side of it, and I cut a section in here, it is touching that part all the way around. Now, you can account for this a couple different ways. What I want to look at is a really cool feature we don't get to see very much. I'm going to delete this intersect. So we could go back and we could change this offset and we could put, say, a half a millimeter or 0.1 millimeter, whatever we wanted for an offset in there, we could do that. I'm gonna show you kind of an all-in-one tool. So we still have our solid body down here and our solid body up here. I'm actually going to get rid of this shell. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this perfectly surfaced match to our wax iron. I'm gonna push it up through this surface with a really cool tool called indent. Now you'll notice I don't have it on my toolbar. Well, one of the really neat things about this shortcut menu is every time you press it, it activates command search up here. And I'm gonna search for a tool called indent. So here's how indent works. This is a really cool tool. I'm gonna say, what is the target body? What do I want to do the indent on? And then what is going to be my tool body? Now, this is the tricky part of the indent tool. Depending on where you pick, so say this surface, uh, say this surface was in the middle, we would have to tell it which way we're going to push through. So we're going to pick the material on the top side. That tells it the top side of that geometry is what we're going to indent with. And this is literally going to push our part. It's going to indent our material from the bottom. Now, here's what's cool. I'm gonna set my material thickness at half a millimeter. And I must be, I had this saved from before. You're already gonna see. So right now it's gonna just, it's gonna be just like what we did before where it touches that surface. But there's a really cool option here. The ability to create clearance. I want, I'm gonna make it very large. I'm gonna put a whole, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put a half a millimeter of clearance in there. So we have a half a millimeter thick material with a half a millimeter of cl clearance. Let's press OK. And then, uh, I'm just sorry, I'm looking at chat there. The one thing that's hard to see is that this will leave the tool body behind right here. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to get rid of that body. We don't need it anymore. The last thing we want to do is add a couple fillets here because, you know, we got to fillet this to make this manufacturable. I'm going to use a nice small fillet here of one millimeter and I could create a second one and a half offset that fillet right there. I'm going to just select this and kind of cheat and do a multi radius fillet so I don't have to create two. So I can create two fillets with a different radius there with multi radius. And voila, there we go. There is our blister and I am woefully behind on time. We're going to be covering the cardboard next. There we go though. So let's take a look at this from the right hand side. Let's cut a section through this and see what this looks like. Look at this. We have a nice half a millimeter offset all the way through there. You know what? We should probably look at our draft as we go in here, right? So we wanted to do a draft analysis on this. Everything looks good. It looks like I have one small spot there. It's 2.7 degrees. I'm not going to get nitpicky over. I don't know why that didn't show up before. It might have been because of how it offset out there. I could go in and I could change that, uh, that split line we did. But I want to cover some other stuff that I really want to get into here. With the 10 minutes we have left, I may go over a hair. So the next thing we need to create is... I'm going to do a box. I, I, may, I may not get to this box, this piece, but I definitely want to get to the piece on the inside. If we look back at this picture, I definitely want to look at this blue cardboard piece that holds this blister in because 
this is uh, kind of an important piece. We're going to do this really easy. I'm going to insert a new component and I'm going to drop it right on the origin. So this part is located where I want it. We're going to call this inner packaging. We are done surfacing. We are now going to look at sheet metal tools to make cardstock or hard paper, cardboard, whatever you want to call this right here. So next step. We're going to create something called inner packaging and I'm going to just start editing this again. Look at this. These are virtual components. So this is really flexible, giving me the ability to just kind of model on the fly. I'm going to go ahead and what I want to do is I want to capture a couple key pieces of information. Oops. Let's start a, let's start a sketch. I want to basically, I want this cardboard piece. I'm going to use the word cardboard instead of hardboard or whatever it's called right there. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. Um, so we're going to make that. What I want to do is I want to capture. I can go into extra time. Absolutely. I'm willing to do that for those who want to stay. I'd like to see this finish. So uh, we want to capture this top surface. And I'm also really interested in. So the clamshell is going to keep this thing from moving. Uh, let's see this side to side and up and down. But while it's sitting in the package, I need this to hold it up. That makes sense right there. So what I want is I want these two to be collinear as well. So these are my two most important things I'm looking at. The rest of this is all support structure. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come over here. I'm going to come over here. Let's add a couple more lines here. And here. And basically I want that cardboard. I just want it to be nice and tight to this guy. Again, using the word cardboard, and that is probably the wrong industry term, but that's okay. You know, why am I having such a hard time picking this? Let's just drag and drop that onto there. Let's give this some height off of the bottom of the box. We'll say 15 millimeters. Uh, this one, uh, I'm going to grab this vert vertex in this edge. So I'm just going to be holding this tight. Reality is you probably want to put a little bit of clearance in there. And then I'm going to drag this back and this here. So what I want is I'm going to fold this. I wish I had this mouse still so I could show this. I'm going to be folding some cardboard over on itself. So I want to create some support here. Kind of see what looks good. So I want to make sure I don't get into having to put a hole in this thing for that cord. So I want to be, let's call it 65. I don't know if you've ever used this, but this is a really useful tool when you're concepting stuff out. This little scroll wheel on the bottom here, you can use this to kind of like, well, what's this number look like? Another way you can do this is if you have instant 2D enabled, you can select a sketch and just like instant 3D, you can kind of drag this around. And I like to use this ruler here. So I'm going to drag this 30 degrees or 30 millimeters looks pretty good. I told you I was going to use sheet metal, but I'm going to create a normal extrusion here. We're going to, uh, Andrew Gross likes intersect plus indent. Nice. Uh, we're going to select this profile here because we have multiple closed contours. We're going to use selected contours. If you go back and watch Mark Schneider show how to do model mania, he loves selected contours. So go back and watch some of the previous episodes on that. I want to extrude this up to vertex. I'm going to try to right click on screen here. And we are going to go up to right up to the edge there. We're going to do the same thing in direction two. We're going to go up to here. And we're going to create a solid body. You guys thought you were going to see sheet metal, didn't you? I want to show you everyone a really easy way to make sheet metal components. I needed a shape. I didn't know what this was going to look like with a sheet metal component. So what I want to do now is I now want to make a sheet metal shape, a sheet metal shape that conforms to this. And there is a very cool tool within sheet metal called convert to sheet metal, where basically I can take a solid shape and I can specify some parameters here. So what am I going to use for thickness? This is probably a half a millimeter thick, but I want to work with numbers you can see. So I'm going to make it one. It should probably be thinner than that. 
I don't know what the parameters for this are in terms of bend radius. I'm not gonna take a micrometer to this, but I'm gonna say half a millimeter sounds good. These are numbers you can always tweak later on. The one thing I wanna do, and I have always forget to do this, is set my auto relief. This will define every relief you do on this sheet metal component. I wanna set this to be a tear, and we'll just leave that half of the material thickness. So what, how does convert to sheet metal work? Well, we say, what is going to be our fixed face? I'm going to choose this face right here. And then all I'm going to go ahead and do is I want to say, I want to bend it here. I want to look at the, look at what it's doing. Let me zoom in so you can see the preview. It's going to put a bend right there. I want to put another bend right here. I want to put another bend on that back surface and another one here and another one here, and another one here. Look at this, this is way easier than creating edge flanges and drawing that shape out. And then I want lastly one here, and notice what it does, it creates a gap. Well, I wanna control that gap a little bit better, so let's go to a right view and zoom in on it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to change the overlap here. So I want this to overlap this way. And it's going to say, do you want it to, how far from the inside do you want it to overlap? Well, I want it to overlap the whole material thickness. So I'm going to say one. So that'll go one. And then this gap right here, you'll notice SolidWorks doesn't ever let you put zero in here. It doesn't want you to merge this geometry together, right? If everybody's heard of the term zero thickness geometry, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. You can get away with it with sheet metal parts. You're going to see that in just a minute. Let's go ahead and create this. Now that internal material, I want it to be a nice glossy black. I'm going to go ahead and add some appearance. Let's just throw this on here. Um, I want to finish forming this cardboard up right here. So what we're going to do is we're going to create an edge flange comes off from here and I want to go, we'll just say up to that vertex. Now I want this material, I just need to go to the right plane. I actually want it to touch. So what I'm going to do down here is I'm going to actually choose to do an offset. I'm going to enable offset and I'm going to say, I want to go up to a surface and I'm going to choose that surface right there. And this sheet metal is going to touch the surface. Now, everybody who tries this, watching the recording later on, is going to go, why do I have warning signs in my tree? Because I have material right now that is, there is zero thickness geometry right there. I don't remember what version of SolidWorks they introduced this, but edge flange, base flange, and some of the other flanged miter flange works, hem works, some of them allow you to get away with zero thickness geometry. And normally you would get errors in your tree saying that there is self-intersecting geometry, but there is an option inside of your options. I have to remember where this was. I turned this off so long ago under sheet metal, maybe. Nope, it is under, I just found this the other day. System options, drawing, system options, colors, performance, right there. Ignore self-intersection check for some sheet metal features. Some, not all. So this does not work for all sheet metal features. But notice, this geometry touches. SolidWorks will actually still let me unfold that, though. It does not actually care that it's touching. That used to be an issue back in the day when modeling with sheet metal. Let's add some side supports right here. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna do an edge flange down off from here. Oh, that doesn't look like what I want. How are we gonna fix that? When you create edge flange, you actually have this option over here where you can edit a flange profile. Now, this isn't the full sketcher inside of SolidWorks, so I can't like come in here and turn on my sketch relation. So I'm actually gonna go through here and I'm gonna say, I don't want this line to be horizontal or vertical, need this one or this one, and you're probably going, well, they're not horizontal or vertical, but they are to that edge. <clears throat> what I want is this line to be coincident with the bottom of this part, or collinear, sorry, wrong word. 
And then basically I want these to be vertical to that line. So if you select a vertex between two points, there's actually, or between two entities, you can actually create some relations right here. One of these is perpendicular. So let's make these perpendicular. Sorry if that just went off screen, I clicked that and then chose perpendicular. Let's go back to the property manager and let's just look at what we're going to do here. I'm gonna let this one come out from the bend. I have my custom relief type, it is a tear, but I actually want this option right here. I don't want it to tear like that, I want it to kind of rip a little bit. Let's take a look at what that looks like. That looks pretty good. We need that same flange over on the other side, so we're going to mirror that feature. Let's take a look, make sure it unflattens. All right, next thing we need to do, we need to create some clearance for that clamshell. So if we go back at our picture, we need to have a hole for that to pop through, right? And the cord underneath. This is probably what I'm gonna be covering today. I'll walk through the outer box and we'll cover that in some detail as well. All right, so we need to create that. Uh, that we're gonna edit this part right here. And I'm gonna just simply start a sketch on this face. I know that it's normal to, or I'm sorry, parallel with that face that's under it because I used good design intent in the very beginning where I was trying to explain it. Somebody said I should have had origins visible and that would have been a brilliant idea. Sorry, I didn't do that. Um, but we want to copy, uh, we basically want to capture where those tangent edges were. Well, the part I'm editing is literally in my way right now. Well, you could actually, we did this with bodies. We clicked tab to hide them and shift tab to show them. You can actually do this on a part in assemblies as well. And it can even be the part you're editing right now. So I just press tab over that. And basically now I'm going to select the tangency. So similar to select open loop I showed before, we're going to select all those lines and we're going to convert those entities. And now I'm going to bring my part back over here by just holding shift and tab and hovering over it. And let's go ahead and let's just create it a standard cut. Now, when you work with sheet metal parts, it captures this magical value called thickness. And I know we've, one of the live designs, they actually talked about how you can exploit this linked value inside of SolidWorks. Its real use is right here. I could do a through wall or an up to next, or I could just do a blind and have the thickness always linked to whatever my material thickness is going to be. So that if it ever changes to two millimeters thick or five, it'll always cut through. So now that cuts through there, we have this cord I wanna deal with. So let's go ahead, let's do some normal sketching here. I'm going to use a slot for this. I like the slot command, it works pretty good. Something like this. So this cord's gonna come through kind of down around here. Let's go ahead, let's add a dimension to, I'm gonna dimension to our origin. I know roughly where I want that to be. Something like that, that looks pretty good. Let's say 75. Let's give this a width. That's really wide, let's go 15. No, let's go 20. And then right here, we only need that to be so long. We're gonna go ahead, let's add some dimensions in here. Let's call that 40. And I have the plug end that's gotta come through here yet. So this plugs into a wall, you know, depending on what region you're in, this plug could be bigger or smaller. I don't want this to be very visible underneath the part. So I'm gonna put the hole for the plug to pass through kind of over here. And let's just, We'll just pretend this is, we can make this as large or small as we want. I'm gonna make this say 40. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna use that sketch. And again, we're going to go ahead and do a cut. And remember, we just did this. We used selected contours a moment ago. We selected contours. I could click each one of these regions one at a time and there's three. You can also select full shape. So I can select the slot and the circle and I can choose to cut with both of those pieces of geometry. Selected contours are a really great way to work. You'll notice I didn't trim any of that geometry up. I captured the intent that this was a slot, this was a circle. 
And that looks pretty good. May want to put some fillets on the inside. I would, I'm probably going to get asked the question, why not use brake corners here? Well, brake corners don't work on non-sheet metal features very well. So I'm just going to come in here and I'll show brake corners in a minute. So what I'm referring to is, is this flange here. Maybe I'm really worried about this sharp paper giving me death by a thousand paper cuts and I, I don't want to cut my hand. I can come in here and we can do this. Uh, it's called a brake corner and I can do chamfers or fillets. This is really important with sheet metal with sharp edges, people banging their heads or catching their hands on it. If I select this face, let's make that bigger. Notice it just finds all those corners. It eliminates that need for me to go in there and pick those little tiny slivers of geometry on sheet metal parts. So there we go. Let's take a look at what it looks like flattened. There is our box ready to have a die cut out of it. Or not our box, our internal box. Sorry, let's get out of edit part mode. We can see that we have our iron. So we basically, for the wax iron, have accomplished this part. Now there is a box that goes on the outside and I'm already six minutes over. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk through the creation of that box. I'm not going to do go click by click. I better save this, huh? I will make this file of these files available as well uh, after this video to upload. Uh, let's call this wax. I, so you can go through it. Mm, I've actually never had that option right there pop up for me. <laughs> let's do wax. Uh, let's save that on my desktop. Wax iron packaging. Save within context references. Save all. I've actually never seen that option pop up when I've done that. Anyway, um, so there's that. Let's give it a nice perspective view. Looks pretty good. So we're going to open up an existing version of this model to take a look at how we did this box right here. Because... I do some wizardry here. So I based this box off from this gaming box. I'm gonna take this gaming gamepad out of here. I wanna explain how it works so you can kind of see what we're doing. Sorry, I can switch to this better view here. So this is the box I kind of wanted to, I based that off from right there. So what's really cool is this box comes, nah, comes down around and up and then then the sides come back through here wrap around the inside that's really bad lighting and then these sides wrap around it so it's really crazy like how they got durability out of this um, so I want to quickly walk through this and some of the things I did to make this happen uh, I cheated on a couple things here for the image, so let me quickly put these back to where they need to be. 90 degrees, so basically this is how I faked opening a box. I changed the bend angle on these from 90 to 30, so I'm gonna quickly put the box back so that it's closed. And we're gonna walk through how I did this. Oops, and I have one more here. Because one of the things you're going to notice is all this material touches right here. This is, I, I, oh, I am not showing my screen. <laughs> so anyway, we're going to open the closed box. I'm going to show you how to make this. And one of the things you're going to notice is this material is all stacked up on one another right here. And how do we make this happen and still be able to create this flat pattern without merging that geometry right there. So we're gonna do this by grabbing the rollback bar and kind of coming through here. So, uh, yep, I'm, there's a little bit of a lag. I'm showing the screen now. Um, so right here, what I did is I started by creating this, uh, this U shape right here. And one of the things I did when I created that is I made it, 
you know what we should uh like edit this um let's do this unlock and then let's do edit in context here let's just do this open desktop let's go into here version one I should be showing my screen now. I'm still see. I'm hoping it's a delay. I should be broadcasting my screen. Okay. So what I did is I created, let's get out of this perspective view. I made this coincident up front. And then what I did is I created an offset over here because I knew that those flanges were going to come back and wrap around this guy. So they come back, you can, it's a black box, not, not very good visual, but I needed enough material thickness for this cardboard. So how I did this was with a dimension of one and it's, I wanted to show what I was going to do this is there's this ability to link values. So when I double click on this, it's linked to the value of thickness. Uh, so there, it, that sheet metal thickness that we can use that and link to that in an equation. So when I did this, I basically went equals global variable link to thickness. And that will always be the same thickness as my sheet metal material. So I did this with a normal sheet metal base flange. This is not using the surface to solid. Then we created an edge flange that wrapped around the front. I left the material thickness in here because I knew that this another flange was going to have to wrap up and come around this surface. So I made this flange go all the way up to the material thickness. Then we came over again, notice it's touching. Now, if I turned this performance option off under performance, I would be getting errors, warnings in my part when I rebuild it. And I'm not getting them right now. I'd have to control Q maybe. See, it does not like that that material is touching. <clears throat> but for some sheet metal parts, it understands that it's still an unfoldable part. So again, if you want to do material on material sheet metal, keep in mind, this only works for some sheet metal features. Edge flange, um, base flange, hems. There's a handful of features it works for. So I folded the material in on itself. I then broke the corners. We saw that option before. Then I came down here and I brought our flange out, leaving enough material thickness for, let's go up here, for these ears, right? So I had to create enough material thickness for these ears to fold inside of here so that it can seal up. So that's that thickness. So then we are going to wrap around the top. And how did I do that? I did that with a hem. So I wanted to do this with a swept flange, but swept flange doesn't like that material on material thickness. I would have had to have put a gap in there and I didn't want to do this. So I used the hem and I just made a really long hem that went all the way down to the bottom of the part. I then decided at this point to mirror this. This wasn't a time I had to mirror this. Um, I'll explain one of the challenges of mirroring with material on material, actually. So the next thing I did is I created the lid. So the lid comes over. Again, material on. This one has a slight gap. I don't know why I put a gap in there. It should have, it could have been on. In fact, I have another version where it's not. Then I came down or no, I have these guys. And for some reason I edited this. These are those inside tabs. I want that to be coincident there. Let's fix that. So let's cut a section view of the front of this so you can kind of see what's going on here. And not a graphic section view either. Uh, whatever. Um, so then, yeah, I created that flange on the inside. Then I rolled down the front. So we created a flange down the front. Then I created a fl that flange that comes into here. I used that technique where I edited the sketch to create the ears. And then finally I mirrored those features over. Now I wanted to talk about what you can and can't. And then the last thing I did is I broke the corners on the inside and that is a flattenable box that we can make. 
where we have material touching one another. So people who used sheet metal probably have struggled with that. I, I mean, the reality is there's a part like this, there's actually significant gaps in here. You know, I could have put those gaps in there. Um, I'm going to look at another version of this uh, where I mirrored it at a different point in time. Uh, let's go ahead and close all this, save all this. Uh, I'm going to go ahead. I think it was this guy right here. I was playing around with, nope, this is not the one I want to open. Yeah, 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 I don't need that. Obviously, I, I played around with different ways of doing this ahead of time. This one, this box is a little bit better in how I did it. So you notice the mirror happens way further down. The only time you can't mirror is when on the mirror, so when you mirror sheet metal, so you know how to mirror sheet metal, I should probably cover that. When you wanna mirror a sheet metal body, the way to do it is don't just pick a plane out here, actually pick one of the edges of the sheet metal geometry and then choose the sheet metal body to mirror. That way it knows that it's mirroring sheet metal and it honors all the bends and everything you do on the other side. Now I wanna talk about why I mirrored here instead of after this front flange came down. Let's actually suppress this. So, notice when I, and this is, I just wanna warn you about a, I gotcha. So now when I try to mirror and I mirror that body, it's not going to work. It's going to say you can't do that with this workpiece. And the reason is, is because I have material touching material right here on the mirror plane. It doesn't know how to handle that right there. Today, it doesn't know how to handle that. So that's why I had to do that mirror because right on the plane I was mirroring about, there was that, um, uh, there was this material touching the material right here. So I just wanna like, let you know why I did the mirror when I did. And then I created the wings that go out there. And then I had to mirror that over the other side. This is a feature mirror, not a body mirror. I like the emoji over there, the packaging emoji. And it works the same way. So this one I did a little bit tighter. I wrapped, nah, that one I didn't do as good. So I was kind of playing around with how to do these. So. Play around with sheet metal parts. I hopefully I was able to convey the bulk of this presentation um, in doing the blister pack and this internal cardboard piece right there. Wish I had a little bit more time to go in more detail into that box, but uh, at the end of the day, it would have been me creating a lot of edge flanges, reinforcing the fact that there is a way for the material to touch uh, but be careful with it because it only works with some sheet metal features. So, all right, I am 18 after the hour. I went a little bit long. Hopefully this was enjoyable for everybody. I will make these models available uh, uh, to access or to download. I will uh, provide, I'll just, uh, you know what? I'll, I'm gonna just make this virtual in here and then I can save it that way. So this is, will be really nice. This is a great way to share assemblies as well, by the way, virtual components. You can actually, um, I can just send an assembly and I don't have to send you any of the components that go with it. So virtual components are great for that. You'll be able to open this up with all the parts and then you can right click and say, save the parts externally. So. Hopefully this was useful. Yeah, great. I love the feedback. Thank you. I, I Hopefully the combination of surfacing and solids and sheet metal uh, was helpful for people. Uh, so with that, I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to stop the stream. Uh, come back to this video at a later time and they'll put a link in the bottom uh, with access to the files themselves. And until next time, we'll see you later. I think we have... Um, we have a couple more of these sessions planned coming up. I think next week we have uh, Jay Sean Jackson, who uh, is going to be modeling like a, a plastic part and talking about some of the challenges of that. And I know we have Omar Zoni on the schedule. He's going to be doing some cool stuff with simulation coming up, I think, in two weeks. So stay tuned and uh, keep tuning in.